So, um, ich muss erst um, Entschuldigung sagen, dass uh, mein Deutsch ist nicht so gut. In, ich kann nicht uh, die ganze uh, Präsentation uh, in Deutsch uh, sagen. So, ich muss sprechen in Englisch. Aber um, um, wenn Sie haben eine Frage, um, ja, ich kann bestehen und kann uh, explainen. Okay. Um, so, um, um, I I'm working at the University of Würzburg, and um, I am a virologist as well as a bacteriologist. And um, um, I'm not a doctor, first of all, so I don't treat patients. Sorry. And um, but it's very important that we not only understand or should have good doctors who can treat patients, but also at the same time we have to have the knowledge which is useful for the doctors to treat the patients. And the reality is that what we practice in the clinics is the knowledge that we have probably acquired 20 years or 30 years back, right? The science has changed dramatically in the last five to 10 years. We have learned so much which immediately should go to the clinic. Yeah? So what we try to do is to understand the disease of ME-CFS from the point of view of infection. And uh, I personally believe that um, there are many different type of viruses which basically live with us. So we all have it. Many, most, most people have these viruses, whether this is um, HHV6-7, which is, I'm going to talk about today, or it's Kaposi sarcoma associated virus. We heard about EBV from uh, Professor Behrens, or other type of herpes viruses like cytomegalovirus or HSP-1, HSP-2. We all have it, right? But we are not sick, right? Some of us are sick. Some of us are suffering from CFS. So what happens? We believe that these viruses, which we normally neglect, we think that they don't do anything, they frequently, they reactivate. And this reactivation is the cause of a lot of problems. The reactivation can occur from many reasons. Sometimes, even a, another infection, for example, a bacterial infection, can kickstart the virus. Okay? We get rid of the bacterial infection, we use antibiotics, but after a couple of months, we get the effect of these viruses, right? It is also possible that um, there are a lot of prescription drugs which has side effect of reactivating these viruses. Even lifestyle factors, where we live, where, what we eat, and um, the environment where we live, all, all factors, they influence these viruses. So, Basically, there are nine different type of herpes viruses that infects human. And we heard about the EVV. Um, what I'm going to talk about here, these three viruses, the HHV6 has two types, 6A, 6B, and the 7. Now, why these viruses are so fascinating for me is that um, we also get these viruses from our parents. So these viruses, um, they can be inherited from either the mother or the father. And the number of such people who have inherited the virus is not small. We don't know what about Germany, how, ma how many people have the virus in everywhere in the body. But if you look into America or Japan or UK, Scotland, the number of such people is around 0.2 to 1%. In Scotland, it's 2.6%. So one in 40 healthy person has a viral genome in each and every cell of the body, right? These are the people who, are, who have inherited the virus. But we all get infections. So HHV6 infection is basically, so basically we, we also get these viruses from our parents. So why these viruses basically integrate and inherited? So if you know that if you look into our chromosome, the ends of the chromosome, which is called telomere, they have a very specific repeat sequences. These sequences, they protect our chromosome for getting shortened, yeah? These viruses, these all three viruses that I spoke about, 
they also have the same sequences at both ends of the genome. And because of this, when we get the infection, these viruses, what they do is, the first thing that they do is that they go and sit inside the telomere of our chromosome. Yeah? EBV doesn't do it. EBV is random. But these virus, 6A, 6B, and 7, they prefer to integrate. So we all get these infections in Germany. We call this tritage fever or fumtage fever, right? And if you go to the clinics or ask the doctors, they don't do nothing. Three days or five days of fever, then you get red rashes in the body, and then everything is fine, right? We carry the viruses later on. The virus is not gone from our body. The virus is there somewhere, salivary gland or anywhere else. So we all have these viruses somewhere, yeah? But there is a group of people who actually have the virus everywhere in their body. Yeah? And these people are always at the high risk of developing many different type of disorders. So um, around 1%, in general, around 1% of the human population have these virus, they get there from their parents. Yeah? And the general belief is that these latent viruses, they don't do anything. Yeah? But this is not true. These viruses very frequently reactivate. We can we, we developed elegant systems in our lab to show that many of the prescription drugs that we take for something else, they kickstart the virus and they reactivate the virus. So what do we know about these viruses? These viruses have been associated with, so I'm using the term association. I'm not telling that these viruses cause this disease, yeah? So these viruses have been associated with many different neurological problems, yeah? We have um, bipolar disorder. Last year, we published a paper showing that bipolar and depression are caused by these viruses. Uh, Alzheimer's, there are many neurocognitive dysfunctions, encephalitis, multiple sclerosis. They are all associated with HHV6 uh, virus. We have Hashimoto thyroiditis, problems with the thyroid gland. This is being linked to the virus, particularly the type A. We have... Um, enough nice data to show that many type of heart diseases, cardiac disorders, they are also linked to these viruses. We have uh, idiopathic pneumonia also linked to the virus. We have adenocorticoid tumors which are associated with these viruses. Mostly um, miscarriages in pregnant women are also linked to these viruses. We have a um, 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 big problem in the transplantation these viruses reactivate after the transplantation because of the immune suppression in the body. So um, um, uh, stem cell transplantation uh, field has big issue with HHV6B particularly. And then we have problems uh, with uh, several type of drug-related allergies. People have uh, extreme sensitivity to certain drugs and later on um, they develop uh, complicated uh, scenarios. So they are all linked to this disease. Now the question is that, if we know so much, so I just want to tell you that if you look into the dates over here, they are all the studies that we have done in last 10 years, let's say, right? Is this information available to the doctors, to the clinicians, or to the house arts, let's say, okay? Do they know that these viruses are responsible for so many different type of diseases? This, this is important for us. Now, why? doctors or even general public do not know that these viruses are linked to so much of diseases because these are all association studies. Yeah? We have found these viruses in the patients in comparison to the controls, but this doesn't tell us that the virus is actually causing any disease. It may be just simply a bystander. Yeah? We need more mechanistic studies. We need proof that these viruses actually do something. And how do they do the disease? Right? So this is what, uh, where we are interested in. So as I said, this virus was discovered around 35, 36 years back. But still, we don't know much about it. Because first of all, they don't infect any other animal, only the humans. So we don't have any animal model to study. And the second thing is that the virus infection is very difficult to study in cell culture because the virus prefers to integrate and become silent. It's like a sort of a hibernation, yeah? 
So we need a system where we can easily identify how the virus is silent and how we can reactivate it. So a couple of years back, we developed the first ever system in the world where what we did is that um, we took a virus, we put a fluorescent tag into the virus, yeah? And then we created a virus and then infected into a cell. We know that the virus will go and sit into the telomere. And this happens. And when this happens, because the telomere are the end of the chromosomes, which are mostly silent. So once the virus enters into the chromosome, there is no fluorescent protein. You cannot see the cell to be green, red, or anything like that. Then we take these cells, and then we put a trigger. The trigger might be a bacterial infection. You infect with chlamydia, for example. Or it can be a drug, for example, very commonly used drug uh, hormones like progesterone or hydrocortisone, the viral genome then comes out of the chromosome. And when it comes out, it starts producing the green and the red proteins. So under the microscope, we can see which cell is reactivating the virus. And this was the most elegant way to identify the cells which are actually reactivating the virus. And this helped us to understand what is going on in these cells after the virus reactivation. Now look into these pictures. Um, I, I will come to um, uh, the mitochondria as such. But if you look into these cells here, the mitochondria, they are expressing green GFP proteins. And you see that this is a healthy cell uh, which is having very nice mitochondria, elegant, structured mitochondria. The moment I add a drug, which is a trichostatin A. Trichostatin A is an um, um, experimental drug. You see that here in these three cells, the virus is reactivating because these cells are red and the red protein is coming from the viral genome. Yeah? So you can see, and you can compare that not only from non-drug treated to drug treated or even in this same area, these two cells are not reactivating the virus and these three are reactivating the virus. And you can see the mitochondria is dramatically damaged in these cells in comparison to the other cells, okay? So this was the first um, eye-opening um, scenario for us that even if the virus is latent, the virus is capable of damaging mitochondria dramatically once it reactivates. Now, the interesting thing is that many times we, we know that we need mitochondria because the mitochondria produces energy, right? This is the first and the biggest function of mitochondria. But not only we need but sometimes when we get infected with different bacteria and virus, they also need mitochondria, okay? And sometimes it happens that some bacteria or viruses, they need mitochondria, and some of them, they don't need mitochondria. I will explain you. For example, over here, it's a chlamydia. Chlamydia can be chlamydia trachomatis, which is a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, chlamydia can be chlamydia pneumoniae, which is a, lo a lung infection causing disease, okay? Now, these are these are, these are bacteria which they infect, they need a lot of energy from the cell. So what they do is that they need really long mitochondria. Yeah? And if you look into the infected cell over here, you see how the mitochondria look like. So this is a chlamydia growing inside one cell. And you look the type of mitochondria these cells have. And the type of mitochondria these cells have which do not have the infection. Now look into these cells, for example, these are human uh, um, uh, primary fimbria cells. Look the mitochondria, they are really crazy long. Yeah? Look for example here, these are the umbilical uh, endothelial cells. Now on the other hand, here, so here is the chlamydia infected cell. If I take this cell and then infect with the virus, you see what happens to them. Yeah? So, same time, two different pathogens needs two different type of mitochondria. And this is what happens when one comes in, changes the mitochondria in a way that when the other virus or other pathogen gets reactivated, they are not in a position to be, uh, uh, to be in a, a normal growth. So mitochondria can be a matter of survival. Now, what, so what I'm going to talk about today is I look MECFS from the point of view of some specific changes in mitochondria. And that is called mitochondrial fragmentation. Now, what is mitochondrial fragmentation? Now, 
We have mitochondria. So, mitochondria, so if, if someone reads a textbook, they will find that mitochondria is a bin-like structures. They are not bin-like structures. They are extensive, uh, like, a, like a city map, yeah? like, a, like a metro map in a big city. They are everywhere in the cell. And um, if you look to a live cell, how the mitochondria look like. This is a video from a live cell taken. Mitochondria is not fixed, not in one step. They are constantly uh, stick to each other, fuse to each other, separate from each other, okay? So if you look into, um, um, for example, over here, you will see that uh, this mitochondria over here is uh, slowly getting uh, separated, for example, over here, and then after some time, it's again fusing with each other. And this is a very constant process that goes on inside our cell, which keeps the mitochondria healthy and enough to produce the energy, yeah? Um, so this process is, um, so how they fuse and how, the, how they separate, there is a protein which is called as uh, DRP1, so think about um, the mitochondria being a very long sausage-like structure, yeah? And you just take two sausage and twist it. It will break, right? So the same way, this protein over here, they bind to the mitochondria and then just squeeze it and break it, yeah? And this is a process which happens in everyone's body, and this, but sometimes this process becomes defective. If it becomes defective, we have more and more fragmented or smaller mitochondria, yeah? And what happens is that we know that the mitochondria is the energy house, it produces energy, but more than that, mitochondria is also an antiviral uh, factor. We, we need mitochondria to fight against the viral infections, yeah? The, the virus, uh, the mitochondria has proteins which detect the viral RNA and DNA and then produce cytokines which goes on and stop the viral uh, growth inside. So the antiviral response is a very important function of mitochondria. And when we have a smaller mitochondria, the mitochondria can no longer produce the antiviral response. And we have technologies in the lab where we can um, uh, not only see each an individual mitochondria, like for example, and we can count the number of such proteins forming around the mitochondria, and we can say in which state mitochondria is. So, from here, how can we link this to MECFS? Now, MECFS, many people doesn't believe, I mean, they don't believe that MECFS is caused by infection, fine, but there is growing evidence that um, MECFS can be linked to many pathogenic agents, EBV, CMV, HHV6, 7, 8, and uh, parvovirus, enterovirus, not only that, mycoplasma, borrelia, etc. cetera. Um, but we, we have to go one step further from here, and so that how these pathogens can cause MECFS, right? So we don't need uh, only association, we need a molecular characterization. Now again, I'm coming back to the picture where I saw that if we deactivate the virus, we have fragmented mitochondria, okay? Now, using our technologies, we, uh, we, we can show that when the mitochondria is uh, fragmented or when we add the drugs to the cells, we have a larger number of mitochondria. So mitochondria doesn't go away. It just converts from longer mitochondria to smaller mitochondria. So you have more number of mitochondria but you have smaller size of mitochondria, okay? Now, um, and we can also show that if we add this drug and we deactivate the virus, the, the protein that I spoke about, the DRP1, they come and they start binding to this mitochondria and start to cleave it and form the smaller mitochondria. Now here, this is more um, um, scientific aspect, but this is where we want to tackle the disease. Um, now, here are the two different states of the mitochondria. This is the longer mitochondria, let's say this is the smaller mitochondria. And we have a protein over here. If this protein is overexpressed, we have smaller mitochondria. If the protein is downregulated, then we have longer mitochondria. And this protein is controlled by another protein called P53. And this P53 is regulated by a very small RNA in our body called microRNA30, yeah? So the thing is that when we have less amount of microRNA30, we will have more amount of this protein, and this protein and this stage. So what happens is that 
when we see the reactivation, we see that this DRP1, P53, they are going up. But very interesting thing is that we see that all starts here. That we have a small microRNA30, which should be produced in a good quantity in a cell. But once we reactivate the virus, this small RNA is no more produced. There is a defect in the production of this small RNA. Yeah? And we believe that this is caused by another small RNA from the virus. So it's only a 23 nucleotide RNA capable of doing dramatic changes in the cell. Now, what we can show that if we take a cell and just produce this small RNA from the virus in the absence of anything else from the virus, no protein, no DNA, nothing else, we can still create the same situation of mitochondrial fragmentation. That tells us that we need only this small piece of RNA, which is 23 nucleotide long, to cause the disease. Now look into the state of the mitochondria, right? I say mitochondria is fragmented when the virus is reactive, but is it making some changes to the cells? Look here, this is also another way of looking into how mitochondria functions. If I put, so there are um, some proteins which, are, which can change color. If you put a laser light into it, they can become red from green, yeah? So for example here, if I put a laser light here, you see that this mitochondria become first red, yeah? And then the red color fuses with the green color to make this part yellow or orange. This is because the mitochondria is exchanging the content between each other, yeah? So one red protein, they just move to other mitochondria and then gets diluted. But if I take a cell which is being infected with virus, even after 336 or so long, you see that this red mitochondria is no more fusing with any other mitochondria over here. This tells me that the mitochondria, even if it is there, it is functionally not that good, yeah? Now what happens to these cells which are reactivating and fragmenting? If you look over a period of time, you see that the rest of the cells are fine, but those cells which are actually reactivating the virus, they are slowly, slowly dying. And if you look into, for example, over the, this is a live uh, video from the cell, you see that the virus is reactivated and over a period of time, the cell just goes and blasts and um, dies out. And this process can cause inflammation, yeah? Because the dead cells, which constantly reactivation of the virus can uh, cause a lot of other issues. We also checked into the ATP production in the cells. They are defective in producing in a proper amount of ATP. We also looked into a lot of um, proteomics, what type of changes occurring inside these cells after the virus reactivation. We find a lot of different type of changes, but most important is that there are so many different proteins which are upregulated or downregulated, and they are mitochondria-related proteins. So mitochondria is severely affected after viral reactivation. Now coming to the patients, so I'm not a clinician. I can't have 200 uh, cases uh, study and study, so, um, Three years or four years back, we got a grant from the SOLF MECFS initiative, and after that, a lot of patients, uh, they uh, came forward and um, they asked if we can test their blood samples and look for our hypothesis. And um, we are very grateful for those patients who came forward and donated the blood samples or any other type of uh, materials, and uh, we, we tried to look. So initially, we thought that uh, science is black and white, and we will look into these patients and we will find lot of viruses and everything will be really nice, but that's not the case. So, for example, I'm just putting a couple of patients over here. If you look into, we looked um, for six and seven. Uh, we also tested hair because if you have an inherited virus, um, you must be positive for in your hair follicle. So we can take just a two hair follicle and test by PCR. If you are positive for the virus, we know that you have got it from your parents and you have virus everywhere in the body. So in these 10 patients, for example, we don't have any positive for hair. N is for negative. Um, that means none of the patients have inherited the virus for sure. Uh, we looked for the whole blood. Only one person ha here is positive for HHV6. We looked for the serum. Um, they are all negative serum. Why do we look? Because classically, if the virus is active, then you should find the viral DNA in the serum because uh, this is called viremia. This is the clinical parameter to look for uh, to diagnose the active viral infection. So they, this tells us that they do not have active viral infection. 
Then what we did is, this is whole blood, but then we isolated the, uh, the mononuclear cells from this blood, and we all of a sudden saw that um, two patients were positive for six, and one, two, three, four, five patients were positive for seven. Yeah, um, it's also reported that uh, more patients, uh, HHV7 positivity is very high in uh, CFS patients. And if I look into the controls, um, this is a case uh, I'm just putting here. This, pa this patient has inherited virus, but he's not CFS, suffering from something else. And you see that positive for hair, positive for blood, positive for serum, positive for PBMCs. Uh, this patient is theoretically a control for us. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, it's expensive. Um, it's, not a, it's not a big task, but if you, if you are asking that if it can be used as a diagnostic tool, um, there are a lot of um, shortcomings. For example, uh, the amount of uh, manpower you need because we need uh, high-end microscopes to understand this, the amount of money that we have to spend. But I will come to it that uh, the results from this can help us in developing cheaper biomarkers. Yeah? For example, the DRP1. DRP1 upregulation is probably a biomarker that we are looking forward to. Yeah? So, um, so, um, so this tells us that the virus is not active. This is also the case, maybe uh, healthy people also will have some scenario like this. Then what we did is that we developed an, another technique. So I told that this small RNA from this virus that can cause mitochondrial fragmentation, and uh, this small RNA can be produced in the, by the virus in the absence of complete active infection. Yeah? You may not have fully active viral infection or reactivation, but you still can have a viral genome which can produce this small RNA. So they are not latent, and we can detect these viruses. So you can see here, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different technique uh, we use to test um, from the blood clot of these viruses. And you can see that the number percentage, which was initially only 10%, goes up to 40% of CFS patients. They are positive for these uh, small RNAs. Yeah? Now, um, in this time, um, um, we, we came across a um, couple of other studies which showed that if you take a serum from MECFS patient and you put it on a healthy cell, you can have all the metabolic changes that you normally see in CFS patients. Um, so we thought, okay, let's see, if we want to use mitochondrial fragmentation as a marker that the mitochondria in these patients is not good, can we transfer this uh, phenomenon from a uh, patient to a healthy cell? So we took the blood from MECFS patients and took the serum and we put it on a uh, healthy blood cell. And you can see here is that if we put, uh, so here is a without serum and with serum. So here is a control, for example, the person who has inherited the virus but not suffering from CFS. Here you see there is not much change in the mitochondria, but if you take the CFS serum uh, and you put, you see the mitochondria is dramatically uh, fragmented after you grow them a healthy cell in the serum. This tells us that the serum has some signaling molecules which are telling a healthy cell to have a fragmented mitochondria. Then we, um, so in another way we tested uh, patients and here three controls and five uh, patients, you can see that um, all the patient serum has the same type of effect on mitochondrial fragmentation, whereas controls has uh, definitely uh, uh, not the dramatic effect. Now, what it, afterwards we did, we went back to our cell culture and we reactivated the virus, and then what we did is that we took the cell culture supernatant. We imagined that if the cells which are reactivating the virus are throwing away some signaling molecules to the media and if we can take this media and can create the same situation. So if we take the supernatant and take a healthy uh, cell and put it, we see the same type of effects, okay? So this tells us that probably the virus-infected cells or virus-reactivated cells, they um, produce some sort of signaling molecules and the other cells in the body 
even if we do, do not have dramatic viral infection, but the body is capable of recognizing that something wrong is going on in some part of the body. And they start to shut down the mitochondria because they want, the body wants to prevent the infection. It's a response of our body to the situation. And this is what uh, probably is happening. And um, we, we are trying to work on it. Um, and we know that the DRP1 is one of the protein which is upregulated. And probably this can be used as a marker. And the good thing is that the, the, the blood cells or the MECFS patients, they are not in one way path. They are not completely damaged that they, can be, they cannot be recovered, right? Mm -hmm. So what we try to do here is that we try to um, uh, grow the um, uh, healthy cells in the presence of the serum for three, four days, and then we change the media and try to see mm -hmm. if we remove the signal from the cells, can we bring the cells back to its normal condition? Mm -hmm. And yes, we can do that. Uh, after four days, the mitochondria are all very small over here, but if you remove it, they again falls back to the normal mitochondria. This means that if we somehow can prevent the mitochondrial fragmentation in MECFS patients, we probably have a chance of recovering completely, probably, yeah? And um, um, we, we, we are trying to um, test uh, several FDA-approved drugs which are already in the market, which is used for other purposes, which is used to several other mitochondrial diseases to uh, prevent mitochondrial fragmentation. If they can uh, um, um, bring um, the, the fragmented mitochondria into a normal state in MECFS, uh, we, 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 we are not doing it in MECFS patients. We're still in the lab, but still we're trying to uh, achieve that. We do not know what causes mitochondrial fragmentation, it can be anything which is secreted. Um, we think that there are probably some exosome-mediated effects going on. It can be simply oxygen uh, uh, radicals, ROS. Uh, it can be RNA and protein. We are working on it. The another aspect is that um, we always wonder if these MECFS patients do not have really severe viral reactivation, and if they have only some of the cells in their body having the viral deactivation. Where is the viral deactivation, right? Is it in blood? Is it in muscles? Is it in brain? And why MECFS symptoms differ in every patient? Some have severe neurological problems. Some doesn't have so much of neurological problems. So we think that probably maybe it is something that um, somewhere in the body the infection is there, and the infection is signaling to the rest of the body, and that causes the, the uh, severe energy deficiency. Um, fortunately, uh, last year we uh, acquired six uh, patient um, tissue samples, CFS patients who have passed away, and their entire body tissues have been preserved. So we have tissue samples from each and every part of the brain, heart, liver, kidney, everywhere. And we are now systematically trying to look that if we can find certain type of infection in certain part of the body of this MECFS patients, which is not there in the controls. Very interesting, it's only preliminary data, but very interesting is that we find the hippocampus region of CFS patients to be infected with HHV6A. Some of the neurons are infected in HHV6A. You can see that this is a staining for this small non-coding RNA that I'm talking about. And you see that the, the neuronal cells over here are carrying plenty of these small non-coding RNAs. So it might just be possible that um, sudden changes in the brain starts producing um, hormonal changes, um, signaling molecules to the rest of the body, and uh, things like that. We, we still at the very beginning of understanding uh, the process. But at least um, I hope that if we can understand um, the, the, what is actually going on in MCFS, we probably can find out a uh, solution um, that we can um, interfere with the process. Yeah? So um, I would like to thank a lot of uh, people um, or, or funding agencies, um, unusual funding agencies, which have been uh, supporting our work. Uh, 
we started a, a very nice grant from the Volkswagen Stiftung, which is um, not a DFG uh, or anything else. Um, we are very lucky to be supported by Solf MECFS initiative, which is from USA. We are very frequently supported by HHP6 Foundation USA. And um, um, uh, two years back, we got a very nice grant from the newly uh, established uh, Helmholtz Institute for RNA-based infection research in Würzburg. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of uh, different people are uh, in collaboration with us, uh, contribute to our work. And uh, yeah, this is a small group of people uh, who are working or uh, moved on in their life. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Ich bedanke mich ganz, ganz herzlich für Ihren Vortrag, Herr Dr. Frusti. Und wir haben nicht allzu viel Zeit, aber eines möchte ich vorweg, vorweg schicken. Wir brauchen dringend Forschung. Wir haben, wer den Vortrag verstanden hat, hat verstanden, dass es Technologien gibt für Nachweise, aber leider steht noch zu wenig, Forschungs, äh, stehen zu wenig Forschungsmittel zur Verfügung. Wir brauchen dringend Unterstützung, um diese Forschung weiter zu unterstützen, sei es über Spenden von Privatpersonen, aber auch natürlich von großen Firmen, von großen Institutionen, von Firmen, die ähm, auch die Technologien an sich mitfördern möchten. Ich denke, da steckt ein ganz großes Potenzial mit drin. Dahingehend müssen wir einfach ähm, unter, für Unterstützung suchen. Und ich denke, für zwei, drei Fragen ist noch Zeit für den, bis zum nächsten Vortrag. Bitte schön. Also diese Frage war eine sehr spezielle Frage von jemandem, der offensichtlich sehr bewandert ist in Genetik. Es ging um die Frage, wie ein Virus es schafft, sich in die Telomere hineinzusetzen und ob die Telomere sich dort öffnen. Das sind ja diese Endigungen der Chromosomen und ob es da spezielle Signale gibt und ob man dort irgendwie einschreiten kann therapeutisch. Yeah, so when the virus is in the telomere, it, it is not active. It has to come out of the telomere to be active. And anything which changes the size of the telomere can bring the virus uh, or make the virus active. That's the reason why uh, you have frequent reactivation in older ages. Because the telomere sh starts to shorten with age. Yeah? So when you have a shorter telomere, you have frequent reactivation. Okay, die Antwort äh, war, dass ähm, es in den Telomeren eingebaut ist und solange das so ist, ist das Virus dort auch nicht aktiv, aber mit fortschreitendem Alter, also Zellalterung, werden die Telomere ja immer kürzer im Zellteilungsprozess und dann kann das Virus freigesetzt werden und kann dann auch in einem höheren Lebensalter als jetzt Jugendlichen, 50, 60-Jährige, dann entsprechend freigesetzt und auch aktiviert werden. No, no, you don't, you don't need to have the telomere shortened only to reactivate. For example, you can have a chlamydia infection, just example. And chlamydia has a protein, but we know now, and if this protein goes inside the cell, it starts to make the end of the telomere to form circles. And then this circle comes out. Yeah? So you don't have to be, I just gave an example that when you have shortening telomere, you can have it. But any drug which works on the telomere, shortens it, can reactivate the virus or any infection also. Yeah. Hier war, Thank you. Also, hier war jetzt die Frage, wie das im Gehirn ist, weil Gehirnzellen, Nervenzellen sich nicht mehr teilen und deswegen auch die Telomere sich nicht verkürzen und ob deswegen dann das Virus auch im Gehirn freigesetzt werden kann. Da ist es so, dass nicht nur altersbedingte Telomerverkürzung für eine Virusfreisetzung zuständig ist, sondern auch andere Faktoren, Medikamente zum Beispiel, aber auch zum Beispiel eine Chlamydieninfektion, die zu einer Verformung, zu einer ringförmigen Verformung der Telomere führen kann und damit dann auch wieder Viruspartikel freisetzen can. Okay, the question is um, the, the inheritance of mitochondria uh, via the maternal line and that there is a damage of mitochondria and repair as you have shown. If that is something that is inherited uh, by the maternal line, oh, how does this work? Are there any ideas? No, uh, normally mitochondria, um, uh, the fragmentation and the, uh, the regeneration of the mitochondria is a normal process, but there are uh, um, uh, some inherited diseases, for example, Alpha syndrome or um, 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 uh, in these cases, uh, the mutations in mitochondrial genes from the parents can be inherited to the children also. So, but this is not a general process. In general, 
uh, everyone has a um, healthy uh, genetic makeup to have the mitochondria regenerated. Uh, Okay, also ähm, es ist zwar richtig, dass das über die Mütterlinie, mütterliche Linie vererbt wird und es gibt auch vererbte Mitochondriopathien, die sehr schwere Störungen am Körper machen, schon häufig im frühen Kindesalter äh, zu schwerer Erkrankung oder Tod führen. Aber das normale, der normale Organismus, der erstmal gesund heranwächst, hat seine körpereigenen Reparaturmechanismen, sodass die Mitochondrien sich, wenn sie gesund sind, teilen können, dass sie sich verändern können, so wie wir es in den Bildern gesehen haben, dass sie sich selbst reparieren können und erst dann, wenn die Erkrankung dazu kommt, dann wird es schwierig. Das, ja. Yeah, uh, I will come to the second question uh, first. Um, some patients have active viral infection. Those patients, they get benefit from treatments like acyclovir, gancyclovir, foscarnate. But we also heard in the uh, Professor Baron also uh, many patients who doesn't get benefit from these. And my explanation is that These drugs only work to prevent the viral replication. And here the viral DNA is not replicating. The viral DNA is active, they produce the small RNA, and these drugs don't work. So we need better drugs which target some other aspects of the viruses. Um, we, we are working on it. We have a drug which is being patented. Uh, we have developed this drug from the scratch. We are testing this drug. Um, um, and um, um, they, these uh, drugs work in a completely different way. And um, coming to the um, treatment, um, as I said, I'm not a clinician. I, I, we are developing drugs. We, we want to go ahead, and if we have some positive data, we probably would um, then collaborate. So um, we, we, we are going to start a collaboration with Professor Behrens and uh, Carmen to test for these um, EVV positive negative children from Munich, uh, 200 patients, and uh, look. Um, I talked about HHV6, but I did not talk that um, we believe that all the herpes viruses have a similar strategy. And uh, we believe that EBV also cause mitochondrial fragmentation is the same way. So we are going to test that if we can uh, see the same phenotype. So our aim is that not to talk about only HHV6, rather go from one step ahead and try to target the mitochondrial fragmentation, even if we have a viral reactivation. Some type of viral deactivation we cannot fight with. For example, the here, we don't have drugs. But what we can do is that there are many drugs available in the market, FDA approved, which very nicely works in preventing mitochondrial fragmentation. Yeah? These are already proven to be safe for the patients. So can we do this, use these drugs and bring the mitochondria back? Yeah? There are many drugs um, uh, we are working on. If you contact me personally, probably I can give you some information on it, yeah. Okay, das war jetzt ziemlich viel. Ich hoffe, ich vergesse nichts. Ähm, die Frage kam von äh, einem italienischen Kollegen, äh, aus, ähm, der sich auch mit MECFS beschäftigt. Und zwar die erste Frage, ob es generell therapeutische Optionen gibt. Und die zweite Frage, ähm, ob antivirale Medikamente etwas äh, erreichen können, was wir vorhin ja schon gehört haben. Die Antwort für die zweite Frage zuerst. Antivirale Medikamente helfen dann, wenn das Virus in der Replikation, also in der Vermehrungsphase ist. Was bedeutet, wenn das sich nicht vermehrt, dann kann das antivirale Medikament nicht helfen. Das ist sozusagen der kürzere Teil der Antwort. Ähm, es gibt einige Medikamente, an denen dort in Würzburg jetzt auch geforscht wird, die verhindern, dass die Mitochondrien so fragmentiert werden. Und das nächste Ziel ist also nicht das Virus zu bekämpfen, sondern zu verhindern, dass die Mitochondrien kaputt gehen. Daran wird im Moment gearbeitet. Äh, und er hat äh, erklärt, dass er noch eine Substanz hat, ähm, über die jetzt noch nicht so viel sagen will, was eben noch in, in der Testphase ist und wo er dann zunächst mit der Münchner Klinik und äh, mit äh, Professor Scheibenbogen in Berlin gemeinsam das an Patienten testen möchte. Die wichtige Botschaft war jetzt aber auch, dass es eben nicht nur um HHV6 oder 7 geht. Äh, wir haben ja vorhin den Vortrag über EBV gehört. Möglicherweise sind es verschiedene Viren, die alle in die gleiche Endstrecke münden. Und ich weiß nicht, ob das jedem im Publikum so klar geworden ist, diese Veränderung der Mitochondrien ist ja so eine Art Überlebensstrategie des Virus. Weil wenn das Virus die Mitochondrien kaputt macht, dann funktioniert die körpereigene Abwehr nicht mehr gut und dann kann das Virus besser überleben. Im Gegensatz zu dem, was die Chlamydien machen, die unbedingt ATP brauchen und deswegen die Mitochondrien so richtig fit machen, damit viel ATP da ist und die Chlamydien sich prima vermehren können. Und ähm, 
Es ist also so, dass offensichtlich mehrere Viren in der Lage sind, die Mitochondrien so zu zerstören, dass der Körper mit ihnen nicht mehr fertig wird, also mit den Viren nicht mehr fertig wird. Und dass das dann zwar keine Symbiose im positiven Sinne, aber eine Strategie ist, wie das Virus im Körper einfach persistieren kann und nicht vernichtet wird. Und deswegen ist die Botschaft, dass an verschiedenen Viren geforscht wird und äh, dass dann also in Zukunft jetzt auch dort die Arbeitsgruppe sich zum Teil auf EPV konzentrieren wird und nicht nur bei HHV 6 und 7 steht bleiben wird, aber es ist trotzdem auch Substanzen, die ähm, die Fragmentierung der Mitochondrien verhindern, sehr im Fokus stehen, weil man damit ja zumindest eine symptomatische Therapie machen könnte, dass dieser absolute Energieverlust, den wir alle ja erleben, nicht so ausgeprägt ist. Ja, die, die Übersetzung der Frage ist, also die Verbindung der postexertionellen Malaise, dieses PEM, dieses Erschöpfungszustandes nach Überlastung zu der mitochondrialen Schädigung. Wo ist die, ähm, wo ist die Verbindung zwischen diesen beiden Phänomenen? Das ist die Frage. Um, yes, uh, there is definitely um, some link um, between um, uh, how we develop uh, fatigue and how we recover from Uh, fatigue and how the mitochondria is, but um, I, I don't think that there is any such scientific study being done uh, so far. We were thinking uh, um, maybe a couple of years back to start uh, in MECFS patients with uh, exercise and then looking into how the mitochondria is just before or after and things like that. But again, um, uh, we are not, we have not done it, sorry. Yeah. Die Antwort ist, dass es bisher keine direkten molekularbiologischen Hinweise gibt, wie diese Verbindung sein könnte. Vor einigen Jahren hat man schon mal versucht, darauf zu schauen, wie die Mitochondrien sich zum Beispiel mit körperlicher Aktivität verändert haben. Das war sozusagen jetzt die Antwort. Ich würde darauf hinweisen, auf das, was schon in einigen vor, vor einigen zwei, drei Jahren Ausgabe der Mitgliederzeitung, da gab es mal eine Erklärung über den ATP-Stoffwechsel. Und das ATP ist ja das, was in den Mitochondrien hergestellt wird. Und dass, wenn es verbraucht ist, dass es dann zu A, also es wird zu ADP, in dem das verbraucht wird, und von ADP wird es zu AMP. Und irgendwann wird das Adenosin einfach mit dem Urin ausgeschieden. Und dann ist eben keine Reserve mehr da, über einen sehr langsamen Stoffwechselweg das ATP wieder herzustellen im Körper, was ein Grund ist, warum Ribose manchmal funktioniert weil Ribose der Grundstoff ist für die ADP-Synthese, um es jetzt mal vereinfacht zu sagen. Das heißt, das kann der, der Weg sein, aber das ist natürlich ein theoretischer Stoffwechselweg, wenn man sich die verschiedenen Stoffwechselzyklen in der Zelle anguckt, bewiesen für jeden einzelnen Schritt ist das nicht, sondern das ist eine Hypothese, dass das so zusammenhängt. Genau, an dieser Stelle würde ich auch ganz gerne unterbrechen und auf unsere Mitgliederbroschüren verweisen und die Broschüren, die vorne aus dem Verkauf ausliegen. Und äh, nochmal ein ganz, ganz herzliches Dank, Dank dir, Bushi. Bushi. Thank you.